to the Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture Academy Camps. The Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture project was launched by the European Commission to support capacity building and peer learning activities for European capitals of culture. It started in October 2019 and will run for 30 months. The project aims at supporting ECOCs through a wide range of activities, which include mapping of the capacity building needs of the delivery bodies of present and future ECOCs, building a pool of multidisciplinary EU-wide expertise to cover the identified capacity needs, organization of academy camps for the European capitals of culture, and the delivery of uh, a series of dissemination activities that in will include webinars and also podcasts, as well as toolkits and training material. The aim of the project, of all its activities, is to provide the European capitals of culture with practical support where skill gaps have been identified, with robust technical assistance structure, a set of tools, materials, practical and theoretical expertise, as well as knowledge, but also trying to enhance the networking opportunities for the European capitals of culture delivery teams. The project is set up by a consortium led by the European Association for Information and Local Development, IEIDL, and its partners, Culture Action Europe, InterArts, and CUT, the European Network on Cultural Management and Policy. This video is to introduce the first of the five academy camps that the Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture project will deliver. The first academy camp dealt with audience development and was carried out from October to November 2020 by an expert team of trainers. And it is my pleasure now to introduce Cristina da Milano, president of ECOM, who led the training and the experts in the delivery of this first academy camp. Thank you very much, Cristina, for being with us. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes, and not only for being together here now, but also for having given us the opportunity of working in this academy camp. As you said, we delivered a training on audience development. And when I say we, I mean a team of experts that actually was working with me on that. So there were Alessandra Gariboldi, who's currently the president of Fondazione Fitzcarraldo, Jonathan Goodacre, who works for the audience agency, and Niels Riegelt, who is the CEO of the Danish Center for Art and Interculture. And they were part of the team together with me, as you mentioned at the beginning. The training activities were addressed to the Elefsina 2021, the organization which is actually leading the process of the ECOC in Elefsina, but it was also addressed to a group of beneficiaries which are the main stakeholders of the Elefsina 2021 process. So the idea was to involve not only those who are actually implementing the program, the ECOX program, but also those who will be working with them in order to widen the scope of the LFCNA project. So there was a vast group of beneficiaries, stakeholders coming from the cultural and the social sectors, and they were all part of this uh, training activity, which was based on four training modules. The first one was about setting the framework. So it was about principles of audience development and strategic planning. And it was meant to create a sort of common understanding, shared understanding of what audience development is and what it means in terms of European cultural policy and what might be its impact on the ECOS program. The second module was about managing change. This module is based on the assumption that audience development being a strategic process implies internal change 
in terms of the organizations which are actually going through this process. So the module was focusing on how to manage this change and how to deal also with not only expected, but also unexpected results of this change process. The third module was much more focusing on practical case studies and practices also from other ECOCs, since it was about iterative planning and implementation. So it was quite, as I said, a practical overview of good practices. And the fourth one was about cooperation and partnership with stakeholders and institutions, since this is a very, very important feature of any audience development process. I think uh, this is it from my side, Mercedes. I'll give the floor back to you. Thank you so much, Cristina. That was great. And you positioned the Academy Camp and explained uh, its structure. Let me just add that it's a necessary addition uh, that we have to do. The Academy Camp took place in October and November 2020 in full thrust of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Let's also say that we had hoped that it could have been physical in presence, uh, but we had to go on to online training and we did it and we're very happy with the result. The aim of uh, these videos is to show professionals in the sector the content of the trainings. We are fully aware that they are sessions recorded live, so they have that aspect of having been done without any necessary aesthetic preparation. So they're delivered the videos as such as were the training sessions. And we really hope that other people beyond the European Capital of Culture LFCNA 2021 delivery team will profit from your knowledge and expertise. Thank you so much to you and to the other three experts for having joined us in this adventure. Thank you, it was our pleasure. In order to start really getting into the topic, I think we all share what are the bases of the ECOC program and what does it mean to be a European capital of culture. This is a very, uh, let's say, general and I would say shared statement about ECOCs which said that European capitals culture improved the quality of life in the cities through culture and art. So the role associated, the role given to culture and art is paramount in this statement. But we have uh, highlighted the second part of, this, of the sentence, strengthen their sense of community, which we think it's probably I wouldn't say more important than the use of culture and art to improve the quality of life in the city, but I would say that it's the most relevant for us when talking about audience development, because who are the audiences? Well, the first ones to be referred to are actually the many communities living in these cities, so for us, strengthen the sense of community is a very, very important part of the statement. And then, of course, there are many other interesting sentences here. ECOC brings fresh life to the cities involved. It boosts cultural, social, and economic development, highlight richness of Europe's cultural diversity. And I think we can all very easily share this vision. But again, for us, the starting point for the whole discussion about audience development is the sentence highlighted in bold. Strengthen the sense of community of the city, which is nominated as ECOC. I will focus on a couple of, let's say, principles which help us in understanding why we got to this point in which people are at the center of these processes. Why are we telling you that people are the center of an ECOC 
strategy, why audience development is so important at European level as far as cultural policies are concerned. Actually, there are, as I said, two important principles which we want to share with you. The first one is Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are talking of something published in 1948. Article 27 actually states, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. As you can see, I have highlighted in red the right freely to participate. Why? Well, first of all, because freely does not mean for free. Freely here means without barriers. And barriers are physical, geographical, economic, but also cultural. And this article states the need to remove all those barriers in order to allow people, every citizen, everyone, the right to participate. But let's say that from a certain point of view, this is quite a passive thing. It is a passive right that each of us has. We don't have to do anything. We just have the right to participate. There is a second document, which is much more proactive, and it's the Faro Convention. And the Faro Convention is a document of 2005. And the Faro Convention is so important for us. And I really love this document. And I love to share with you all the power of this document because it moves the highlights from the monuments, from the places, from heritage, tangible or intangible heritage, it moves the highlights from that to the people. The Faro Convention affirms that cultural heritage, tangible or intangible, it's not important because of the meanings and uses it might have on its own, but because of the meanings and uses that people connect, attach, give to it. So if people are not recognizing meanings and uses and values to cultural heritage, then the value in itself is not, let's say, the main thing which emerged when we talk about cultural heritage. So the accent is being, has been shifted from cultural heritage to people, and people are, need to have a shared responsibility also in the protection, in the care, in the process of adding values to heritage through the meanings and uses they make of heritage. So peoples and communities are legitimized. They have to give meanings, values, and you make use of heritage. Okay, so it's not just a passive right, the right to participate, but it's an active role we are talking about. And that's why this document is fundamental for an audience development strategy. It's about people. It's about empowering people in giving meaning to heritage. If we don't give meaning to heritage, then we do not recognize its values. If we don't recognize its values, then this heritage is not relevant for us. And how do we recognize the values? What are values? I will make a short exercise with you. Do you know what this is? Somebody knows? Any idea? It's an ancient theater mask, if I am wrong. No, that's a good start. Okay. What else? <laughs> Thanks, Florida. Fiorida. What yes. else? Hi, I think it's a fortune teller. It's Would a fortune know? teller? That's also true. Hi, then. Uh, somehow it says some predictions about you with your head inside the mouth or not. Mm -hmm. You are close. Yes. Yes. What else? Who else? 
First of all, do you know where this thing is? Italy. It's in Rome. Yes, it's in Rome. It's in Italy. But to cut a long story short, I will tell you what it is, and then we will discuss how its meanings and values changed through history. This is uh, actually, it's a mask, not a theater mask, but it's the head of the river god, Tiber, and it was placed next to the river in Rome, and it was part of the sewery system of the city. Do you know what I mean by sewery system? One of those things which are placed on the ground where the rain goes into. When it rains, instead of flooding the roads, the water goes in, went, used to go inside its mouth, nose, and eyes. Like, same thing, we have them in our cities nowadays, although they do not have this, say, look. So it was part of the system of the drainage and sewery of the ancient city of Rome, which means what sort of value did it have? It had a functional value. It had a purpose, a very practical purpose. Then what happened? The Roman Empire fell. The systems, the aqueducts, the roads, also the sewery system were disrupted. Nothing worked any longer. And during the Middle Ages, people found this thing and they didn't know what it was because it had completely lost its functional value. And then people started thinking of a sort of cultural value of this thing, which was related to a legend, to a myth. And some of you mentioned it. The legend said, if you are a liar and if you put your hand into the mouth, the spirit which is inside this object will bite your hand, revealing to the world that you are a liar. So a sort of magical, superstitious, cultural meaning was attached to this object. So from the functional value, it gathered a cultural value. Then what happened? At the end of the 18th century, archaeology be became a science, more or less in that frame of time. So archaeologists started studying this thing and they said, look, this is not a magic object. This is part of the sewer system of the ancient city of Rome. So this object gathered again a historical value. It was placed in time and history. Then something else happened in the 50s or 60s. Do you remember that movie, that American movie with Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn? They were going around Rome with a Vespa and the title of the movie was Roman Holiday. And Gregory Peck was putting his hand into the mouth of this thing and pretending that the thing had bitten him and he started shouting and she was almost fainting and all this nice hmm, movie thing. From that moment onward, this mask, which is called Bocca della Verità, which means the mouth of truth, became a symbol of Rome. Now, if you have visited Rome, I don't know, Rome is full of little magnets, images, postcards of this thing, which has become a symbol of the city, like the Colosseum, more or less. Okay, So it has gained a symbolic value. Well, who determined these values? Who decided that this object from a functional value pass on to a cultural value, an historical value, and a symbolic value? Who determined these values? What do you think? It is, of course, the people. That's... Of course, the people, exactly. So it was the people, it was the community Hmm? living next to this thing, who decided or, well, gave to this object different meanings and different values in different times. But if we don't see values in objects like this, then these objects immediately lose their relevance. So, in order for people to see the relevance, they have to see the values of it in their own life. If not, these things are totally 
meaningless and totally they totally lack relevance which is the problem nowadays with cultural heritage with cultural activities very very often people do not perceive the relevance of it within their lives we can go on in the next slide and we are almost there how can we make people perceive values or express their own values and meanings because it's not a matter of communicating communicating given values it's a matter of exploring making emerge what are the values that people give to these things we are in a period of very strong and difficult societal changes due to well economic and not only i mean in this particular moment societal changes are, are also linked to many other let's say contingencies we are overwhelmed by an explosion of information of all sorts which sometimes make it difficult to give meanings and values to things we have also an enormous amount of digital opportunities which at the same time might be threats because we know that the digital world have you seen that documentary film the social dilemma which is about social media talking about you know opportunities and threats of the social media and we all know the implications of that with specific reference to the making of meanings we also have an enormous choice an enormous choice of leisure activities that obviously we have to prioritize so why should we go to the cinema or to the theater instead of going to doing something else like shopping or whatever so the relevance and last but not least we live in an era where there is a very very great conflict between objectivity objective meanings objective values and subjective meaning subjective subjective values and it's very difficult to make these two things meet and create a sort of composition of the meanings and values we give to the world so we have a problem in defining the perception of relevance and if we don't solve this problem this is not going to help in any way in an audience development process aimed at including and making people as the main stakeholders of the process so we have to understand what are the values what is meaningful what is relevant for people capitals of culture in terms of ambitions uh, are all very high and they are all about people especially if you look into the last waves uh, let's say of uh, european capitals of culture we are here you have you have rieka golway plodvit and uh, matera 2019 and these were quite strongly based on the idea of strengthening the community not only as aims but also as means considering culture and people as the two sides of the same coin somehow so people not just as the beneficiaries somehow but also people as the main players of what culture in the same definition of culture and whatever without these considerations ecocs are meaningless and this is why the idea the work within rieka 2020 for example but also i can say also for matera open future because I, i've been also working there and i can tell you that we all agree that those processes were quite strongly based on audiences since the beginning talking about audiences as communities visitors or temporary visitors as matera called them they are all somehow they have all been working a lot beforehand on the idea of audience development which is something not so common in the previous european capitals of culture of course it, it has always been part of their identity and their meaning as you were saying by the description that uh, christina shared with you in the beginning but still in these last years this has come even stronger 
And this is particularly important for you because you are not in the event yet. So getting ready for that means to acknowledge since the beginning that this is where we want to get. And this is also the way we want to get, we want to take to get there somehow. In the case of Eleusis, of course, the title of ECOC is in your same bid. This is the, from your dossier. It's worth coming back to the things which are written there, which are quite consistent with what you were finding out in your small groups before the, the break. And it's about changing the stereotypical image of Eleusis as an industrial area. And this is precisely what you all stressed as the most negative side, let's say, of the city in terms of its results, let's say, like pollution, but also in terms of its richness because of its contemporary history is linked to the typical diversity of the industrial development. And establishing Eleusis as a dynamic cultural center in the region, which also reminds to what Yanis was mentioning before about the idea that you are so close to Athens that technically people don't need to have something in Eleusina, in Eleusina because, of course, they can find it there. But still, Eleusina has a lot to say and a lot to give in that sense. Then a better understanding of the Greek case and therefore the promotion of mutual understanding among European citizens. You will tell me more about this Greek case eventually. And the goal of keeping young people in the city as, of course, given especially the attraction of Athens and developing the dynamism, creativity and social cohesion of the city. So if you consider all these as the, let's say, big aims, the big goals of, the, of Eleusis, as ECOC, you should consider that all these strong implications for audiences and audience development. So when we talk about audience development, we are talking about the whole process as such. So why audience development and what it is, actually? This picture, Christina loves so much this picture because it really helps understanding what audience development is not and what audience development should be. So first of all, audience development is not about having more people in our venues or at our events, not at all. It's not about more people just because when you consider audience development as a concept, which has been framed, let's say, in the last 10 years, more or less, in Europe, reframed, let's say, is a concept which has to do on one side with the, of course, relationship between culture and audiences, meaning that is something that has to do with, of course, the quantity, because we, are, we want to have more people. It's not that we don't want that. The point is that we want people more full of meaning and happier, why not, and more competent and more knowledgeable and more keen to diversity and more able to listen, for example, and to recognize also diversity as a value, as you were also mentioning when speaking about Elefsina. And the point is that the concept of audience development, let's say, as a word, as a label, it appeared in the late 80s in marketing studies. It was only about, let's say, enlarging the number of people and sometimes maybe diversifying the kind of people which were attending, who were attending cultural events of any kind, going to visit a museum or attending a show or whatever. From this marketing perspective, especially thanks to further developments, and especially thanks to the fact that the European Commission acknowledged the, this as a priority within the Creative Europe program, is that, of course, this is not just because we have a problem with democracy and we actually missed the point of enlarging the chances for people to interact with the cultural or to have cultural experiences but also a concept that reminds us that most of the audience development issue is not about them, but about us. So if people is not coming, maybe it's our fault. If people is not enjoying, maybe it's our fault. And there is something we should change within the cultural processes and cultural production system so that culture is really able to become relevant to the majority of our citizens. So just to introduce a little bit about segmentation criteria and what is segmentation, why it is needed, and how could use it. We first come from the idea that I already know that you were considered in, in your dossier that audience 
distinction we did between audience by habit, by choice, and by surprise is not which we adopted with Christina in the study engage audiences that I was probably mentioning last time. Mm -hmm. Just wasn't the segmentation at all. Was just a way to look into people from a different perspective. So to look people as stressing, let's say, the idea that everybody can be an audience in some way everybody can be an audience and mainly one of the way you can look into people is people who are usually attending arts events or who have what in sociology is the habitus of attending cultural events because they feel it's part of them it's something to which they give value they value it because they feel good when they when you have cultural experiences those by choice, which are the ones who usually don't, maybe they do, they have some kind of cultural experience, but not that one, not all of them. They are maybe quite conservative or quite niche or not very curious or many, many barriers, but not people with, let's say, social or economical important barriers. So we are not talking about people in um, marginal situations of all kinds because they, they have a disability, they don't speak the language, they feel excluded for some reason, or they are excluded for some reason. But people like us, who maybe go to the theater but don't attend dance stuff, or they watch movies on Netflix but they don't go to the cinema, or they maybe go in open air fairs and so on, with, all, with also cultural aspects, but they don't attend yours events, which are maybe more focused on an art form. And then the audience, by surprise, who are the ones who are really hard to reach because they are not the ones attending, never, because they don't feel this is for them. And People here, if I can add to yeah. what Alessandra is just, just saying, audience by surprise are those who really have barriers and obstacles which prevent them from participating. Barriers which can be economic, social, cultural, geographic, but are really strong, strong barriers preventing them, but not even, let's say, letting them come closer to what a cultural activity is. So sometimes they are what we define hard to reach and hostile. There is also a certain degree of hostility sometimes from this particular group of population, let's say. And that's why it's a very delicate segment, if we want to call it like that, even though this is not a segmentation. No, okay. So this is just to give an idea that looking into people might be done from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And this is a perspective that helps us identify actually those who are acquainted with the idea of culture, of cultural practice, as we call it, not just the cultural practice in the anthropological sense of whatever is cultural, whatever is human with kind of a symbolic value, it's cultural. Okay, so even fashion or just food, you know. But the idea of culture that we usually do have when we talk about the culture with the capital letter, I mean culture done by professionals with some kind of art forms or whatever. Because in the other hand, everybody has a culture. So there's no one without culture. We all have our culture in which we are somehow, uh, from which we are surrounded, by which we are surrounded. So segmentation, what it is. Segmentation is a way of looking into a market, would say the market, so in a, in a population, so in a group that allows to identify groups enough homogeneous to be considered achievable with the same more or less means and call to actions and tools. This means that, for example, when we consider segmenting, we are not cutting people or putting people into boxes, but in a way, yes. We all know by experience that if you look at people from very, very close, they're all different. There's no one individual that, that it's the same of another one. Okay, so we are all different. If you look at them from very far away, they do look all the same. So the average human being, which of course doesn't exist. So to look in for a segmentation means to take off the glasses for looking from too close and take off the glasses for looking from, from far away, but to find that distance that helps you considering subgroups of people sufficiently homogeneous that you can actually tackle them through precise strategies. So segmentation acknowledges that audiences are all different. And they are different in the way they participate, in the level of interest, in different backgrounds, opportunities to be involved, levels of awareness of what you do, for example, also, or possibilities to take part in terms of 
time, money, for example, you were mentioning about workers having no spare time to use for leisure, for example, or looking for different benefits from a cultural experience. For someone, it will be entertainment. For someone else, it will be giving meaning to things. For someone else, it will be sharing a meaningful experience with someone. So they're all different. So to be challenged, to be reassured, to feel secure, to feel unsecure, you know, people look for very different things when they're seeking for a cultural experience. So acknowledging this difference is the basic respectful act we can, we can start from. So acknowledging that segmentation is not a marketing tool for the evil, but uh, a marketing, uh, let's say, gift <laughs> to us to understand things. And by the way, it's more soci sociological than marketing as a, an approach. So we all know that stereotypes and categorization are part of human nature. And we should always keep this in mind, that when we think about people with disability, for example, we never think about those who are temporarily or situationally, for example, in this case, without some kind of sense, for example, touch or see or hear or speak. So we don't think about a physic. So there's people who don't speak, but of course, there are also those who can't speak because they have laryngitis or because they have a strong accent and they don't feel so comfortable. And so these are all, let's say, the layers I ask you to look into. When you look into people, we, we always apply, we always, always apply stereotypes. And we always apply categorization. And this is normal. We should usually overcome this. And when it comes to relate to them, actually, you will have to do that through also empathy. But in the first place, when you have to look into people in a very wider sense to consider, okay, where do I start from? You need that kind of mapping that Yanis was presenting. You need to start from somewhere. Otherwise, you don't know how to look into them. So before the constructing through empathizing and deeply understanding who your audience will be, you need a kind of a segmentation to frame your purpose and address it to someone. And after that, you could go into considerations more, I mean, deeper ones, no? And proper segmentation. And this because if you consider segments, which is a very hard task, this is just to introduce to the idea of segmentation as such, if you consider segments just described by some descriptors, what in sociology are called descriptors of their characteristic, you might think that young people is not enough. And so you can think, okay, young people who, muse, who are music lovers, but you can end up here. These are both young people and these are both music lovers. And if you go even more and say, okay, let's try to be a little bit more sophisticated. Let's introduce some more criteria into our segmentation. And you say, okay, male, white, is British, is 70 years old, is a music lover, and is quite influential. What's the picture you have in your mind when I say this? With more, let's say, more sophisticated, apparently, segmentation. The point is that we end up here, and they are both perfectly fitting that segment. Okay? So this is the point. We didn't ask ourselves what was relevant to them. So their lifestyle, interests and values so we no, have no idea about those things while we use this segmentation criteria for example because we don't get what is important to them and so we don't get what's the point when trying to get in touch with them what do they value what do they need so segmentation parameters are many and you can use and balance and cross those segmentation parameters in many ways they are, of course, demographic, so it's about age, gender, family size, life cycle, because it's not, I've got a family, but if I am retired, it's quite different if I am a worker or if I have young kids or adolescent kids, for example, teenagers, because they are completely different needs when it comes to be a family. Or location, of course, where do they live? Are they far away or not? Do they live close to the center or whatever? Then socioeconomic parameters like education, profession, income, mobility. Can they move actually around or not? Or they can be also related to the product you want to do. So do they know me? Do they, are they interested in such of things? Which are the benefits they expect or desire from, they look for when they have an experience of any kind, which is the expected experience. So what do they expect? And so which expectation I need to be up to? or of usership, just like, for example, the audience uh, by surprise, by chance, is a way of considering, are they 
related to culture frequently, uh, which kind of loyalty, how do they use and experience culture, or even psychographic in the sense of lifestyles, personality and attitudes, and values. So this is just to say, I'm not expecting that you are segmenting the population of, just to be clear, we are not expecting you to segment the population of uh, Elefsina in this way or now, okay? It's just to tell you that segmentation parameters are always contextual. If you need to sell a shampooing for, or an air conditioning for blondes who to make clear your airs, you will need to consider as a segmentation parameter how many people with dark hair you have in your city, which is a completely unrelevant parameter if you have to consider other kind of segmentation and you have to sell shoes, for example. Okay, so it's just to say that segmentation will be refined over time together with the people you are already working with, as Yanis was mentioning, also depending and according to the kind of things you want to do with them and for them. So just have a look to a tool, a theory of change, which is a way to look into our challenges when it comes to organizations who want to have an impact of some kind in a way. A theory of change is actually, there are a series of theory of change at the moment. And I would say that in the last 10 years, they've been very used, especially in the social sector. They are a kind of a logical framework if you are somehow acquainted with those kind of tools is basically a description of a program intervention or initiatives that shows how interconnected elements lead to the accomplishment of a long-term goal. Actually, it brings you through a set of logical steps, helping you starting from the impact you want to have backward until what you have to put in place in order to, in each step of your actions, achieve that impact somehow. You can find many resources in the any websites. Here is one reference, the theoryofchange.org. We are not going to show it now, but you have a, here a link of a video created by um, Nesta UK uh, that helps a lot trying to understand in, in showing which is the process. In this case, is the process of designing. Here on the right end, you can see the, the kind of impact they want to achieve. And uh, backward, all the steps you have to do to fill in, let's say, to get to that impact. What is very relevant of the theory of change is that besides giving you the different steps, it also gives you what you see with the blue post-its at the bottom, it also helps you to see which are your key assumptions because actually you have no actual control on what will happen to achieve that goal, but you have assumptions and you might take into account those assumptions as risk assessment, let's say, of what could not happen uh, between one step and the other. So to work in this uh, direction using these tools, the first thing to do is to frame the impact. So de defining the impact vision or mission that you want to plan or evaluate, because this is also a very interesting tool for evaluation, and uh, but also for planning somehow. So when it comes to a specific audience, or in the case of LFC, now thinking about the audience who is basically citizens of LFC and beyond, you have to focus very strongly on what do you want to happen to them. So what's the change that you want to see? in those people, for those people. This is the first important step. And then the second step is to build that logical sequence, let's say, of a, the initiative, which is, let's say, the dynamic through which you are willing to achieve that results. One of the most interesting things of theory of change and one of the reasons why we thought that it was uh, worth to present in the frame of Elefsina 2021 and in this academy in particular is that the theory of change is a very interesting frame, let's say, especially for negotiating impacts. The idea that you have to involve stakeholders you to, in order to define what's the kind of impact. For example, if you want well-being for a certain segment of population, you have to, to discuss with them what is that will be about. So what does it mean well-being for elderly or for youngsters or whatever? So this is a very important part and it's also that you really in a relational process you really negotiate 
each single step. And it can really be helpful also thinking about an effort like the Elipsina 2023 thing is that all the different components of the project, so all the society components, Elipsina staff, cultural institutions and organizations, they can work together on the kind of impact they want to achieve. Of course, it will be achieved through many different means, but still could be a very good way to, to do that. This is an example uh, just to show you it concretely works. It was actually created by the Arts Impact Fund. Here you can find the link as well. And the Arts Impact Fund is an initiative of Nesta, once again, uh, trying to bring social impact investing on board. So they did try to create a framework that based on theory of change that could help organizations to become more transparent in what they want to achieve and also to see on which assumptions they based their idea that what they're going to do was going actually to create a kind of an impact. In this case is about an activity for or a theater based activity for performing arts uh, based on workshops casting aim long term let's say outcome or impact is to uh, support uh, youth offenders to re-engage with formal education provision or employment. So the idea is that those kind of guys usually have a lot of uh, troubles in trying to find a normal way of life and to get out from, let's say, from the spiral of the crime somehow, of, of being offenders. And, and since they are young, they thought that this could be a way. So the theatre company here wants to address this social issue through theater. And what they do actually is that defining that the long-term impact they want to have is to re-engage with for, um, these kids to re-engage with formal education is that they want, and the kind of activity they want to put in place are essentially drama workshops aimed at young people that have been uh, through the justice systems and a mentoring program with the idea that this is not enough. It's not enough to reinforce, let's say, their capacity through theater, but also they would need a kind of a support, external support to not, let's say, uh, drop out during the process. What is very interesting here is that their mission, their this overall impact vision that you can see up on the right is to improve life chances of young people through theatre, which is a very interesting impact vision that is based on the statement, let's say an assumption, that is that mainly these guys, these young people, usually lack opportunities to engage with arts and uh, lack opportunities to engage to, with activities that improve their soft skills. And in that area, there is no provision of theater. So based on that, they design the activities. And what is interesting is that they do create it and let's say uh, split the results of the activities into normal outputs, let's say, so the concrete things that will happen, one workshop per week and so on, short-term outcomes, greater sense of routine for beneficiaries, routine that is maybe usually not part of the life of these young people, and fewer in exclusions amongst participants because of the mentoring program that helps them going through them. And this is what they think they could happen in the, in the short term as these things happen. But then how do we get from the short term and the long term impact? They try to envisage how a medium term in outcome could help. And it was, okay, if you gain a greater sense of routine and are used to engage with something, they will feel in a, after a while improved in terms of self-confidence and develop empathy and all the related behaviors. So these are the steps. So I'm not just assuming that since I do theater, they will be happier guys, but I try to see what will happen and this also means that I will have to check that this is happening and to put in place all the actions that allow these things to happen. So this is a kind of example, so let's say, of a theory of change. No, but I think it makes good sense to where I'm going. Alessandra and I just discussed that some of the opportunities that you guys have could lie in really addressing the capacity and the work power and the engagement of the structure you have around you. And um, that could be, for instance, touching into participatory and voluntary collaboration and, and see how that can actually both support and influence uh, your progress. 
So my first slide is very much about how engagement and participation in the arts is basically ensured by power and resources and influenced by urbanization, social political tendencies in society in Elefsina, how cultural politics influence the design, how audience and diversity, digitization, competence and innovation all are part of that same, let's call it, backdrop for producing, presenting, relating the art and culture with the audience. So in order to, to resonate in a wider part of society, to be perceived as something relevant and contemporary that people would like to, to attach themselves to and experience, a co-creation, cooperation and collaboration have become the new, basically the new black, the new language of the sector. And one reason of that is because the traditional sector as we know it, the, the temples is changing and they are becoming more porous. Digitization is challenging the exhibition uh, formats as we have known them, the performing formats as we have known them, music experiences as we have known them. And there is a, a greater expectation of participation in the event itself, of preparing it yourself for going somewhere, for taking part in it and for actually consuming it afterwards uh, and giving it an afterlife. So there are op institutions tend to operate inside and out. In, in Elefsina, where you don't have that many institutions, you could say operating out will be one of the things that you will have to consider as an opportunity to engage people who do not necessarily engage in nearby institutions. As some of you said earlier, they engage in, in Athens, which is in the center, being just a few miles away and you are in the periphery of that center so you need to get the periphery into some kind of focus and that focus could very much be about how you anchor activities outside of institutions but inside you know, communities and parts of the city and unexpected facilities etc so it's very much about creating meaningful exchange with your audience and combine that with a kind of holistic understanding of how culture plays in the community is something fundamentally changing the discourse of what you're going to show. Alessandra and I talked about, well, one way of actually doing that, also because you don't have a lot of infrastructure in terms of, of institutions with professional staff, you will have to build an infrastructure. That infrastructure might kind of anchor in an organization where you have a lot of people to tap into, you could say, the people of Elefsina, the workers of Elefsina, the, the people and the workers of the near, nearby communities. It could be the people you would tap into. So we decided that we would give you two examples. And the first example is coming out of your predecessors in Galway. Galway is um, ECOT right now, and they are obviously under a heavy influence of what's going on during the pandemic, they're trying to deal with the pandemic, they're programming on behalf of the pandemic, they're trying to maintain their focus and keep the nose in, their nose in the track while the circumstances have been completely rewritten and changed. But what they have done, which is quite interesting, is they've created a course of, of wave makers. We call it the Galway example. You will probably hear more about this when Marilyn will come uh, later on and explain from the director's point of view how they actually accelt the challenges they've made on the during the way on 2020. So the Galway example as an example is very much based on the notion of getting people to engage and the level of engagement uh, shown by the Galway people were basically defined by the people themselves. The Roskilde Festival is not an ECOC, but it's one of the largest festivals taking place in Europe on an annual basis. It's existed back since the, um, the 70s, and now it, it kind of extends the city of Roskilde with another 130,000 people every year. 130,000 people, of which 30,000, almost one third of them are volunteering. What makes that possible is basically that they have redefined what the event is. The Roskilde Festival is a rock festival. It's a festival which has kind of presented itself as presenting the elite, the absolute top acts that you can get to. So everybody, you know, Coldplay, U2, uh, they've all played at the Roskilde Festival. But they are also the festival that presents 
what the most interesting upcoming bands from a number of sub related genres to 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 rock it's not a pop festival it's not a jazz festival it's a rock festival and it gathers people from all over northern europe and also from abroad and from the us because it's next to the glastonbury festival in in the uk it's actually the largest festival of its kind but it's also a sub festival of food a sub festival of events of energy of relationships and and they have grown it into becoming a festival with a huge amount of activities all year around it's activities from you know cleaning the toilets in the one end to getting people to cozy down and massage clubs and you can have there are even a sauna club there's a naked race and there are all kinds of activities that all kinds of people with different preferences can sign up to and all these activities are seen as contributions to what is at the core of the festival the music so they've surrounded the music with a bunch of activities that actually allows people to connect and in fact the Roskilde festival is a festival that runs from Wednesday to Sunday so you have Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday and Sunday you have five days of music but the festival sites opens the Friday before so you have another five days of people connecting and last year and the year before they have had between 40 and 60,000 people camping already in the weekend before the festival takes place taking part in all kinds of activities that is run by volunteers that is run by people creating this notion of the festival the story of the festival these can be anybody it can be the local rafting group or a boy scout group or it can be the syrian cooking community or anybody that wants to contribute to the festival with something they are actually skilled in doing have an opportunity of applying and presenting a plan for what they would like to do they have professionalized it so it's not that the volunteers are doing festival work necessarily that is about producing of music but they're doing lots of work that is about getting people to feel to belong to connect to socialize to feel safe to navigate etc so the festival has really turned it into a huge kind of one week event where the music only is part of it even though it's the core of the festival they also seem to be, have been able to create a an international guard of volunteers so you can volunteer as a greek you can come from elefsina and be a volunteer at the Moskil festival and as such become part of an international group doing things together not just because there is an international audience because you as in this case very often a young person would like to become part of an international community yourself so volunteering as an international is also about very much actually so about creating this international atmosphere this international connection for young creatives or young people that want to get out there and get a sense of what it's like to be young somewhere else and you can be part of co-creating programs as a volunteer as well so the volunteer position is something where you can actually even go in and say well we are a group of volunteers and we would like our program to be part of the official Roskilde the program because we have this idea and then you can actually get that so what you see here is basically the whole festival site which is a huge field area outside the city the medieval city of Roskilde with the famous Danish king's graves it's it's a very historical area but this is actually just a farming site on the other side of the city on the less UNESCO stamp site of the city and there they're building up a huge community and all the green spots you see on this map are basically the camping areas so this is where the village grows up with main streets and side streets and side effects so it looks very much like a refugee camp it looks like an oversized camping site and then it has just like a city it has its temples you know the signature buildings in this case the signature buildings all the red ones here are stages different kinds of stages and here you have the main stage and this gives this notion when you go to a Roskilde festival that there are always people on the move people going somewhere going to a concert and they're going to take part of something or they're going to eat or they're going to take part in something voluntary but they are setting up a living community of 130,000 people for a week
just kind of take it to what we've described as barriers versus benefits. That is the reasons why people don't engage and the reason why people do engage. And we're just going to have a look at what it is that we know from our research and our experience audiences tend to say about why they don't engage or why not. And I think very often, let me just say, Alessandra has this very nice phrase now, which she says is, instead of us looking at what's wrong with the audience, let's look at what's wrong with us. Maybe wrong is a bit strong, but a lot of the traditional way in which audience development has been discussed in the past 10 years or so is to talk about people not being engaged because of the people that they are, i.e. that they are people who don't understand our work, they're not educated, they're not, they're too stupid or something like this. But what we want to look at is actually it starts with us. And many of the reasons why people don't attend, don't engage in a whole variety of different cultural spheres, not just traditional high culture, but all sorts of different types of culture, is because of the way in which we ourselves put up some barriers. Here are three quotations from focus groups, uh, discussion groups that I have found. So we do quite, sometimes we do work with people who are not much engaged and we ask them about why they don't engage with culture. And very often these are the sorts of things they say. So these are actual quotations that are picked out from three different projects. So someone says, I would never come to this place on my own. I wouldn't feel comfortable here. There's an impression you get from the publicity that it's all going to be quite deep. Someone else says, I don't have any relaxed, cool clothes, so I would feel a bit odd here. So that's kind of this thing about, it's not just about high culture that people feel alienated from. I might look stupid not knowing what's going on or what I'm supposed to do. This is quite a common thing we find with for example, people going to museums where people who don't go to museums, who might go with their children, they're not sure if they're going to feel a bit stupid when they go there, that then it's not for them, and also that they're going to feel a bit stupid in front of their children. So it's doubly bad, doubly difficult. Not only do they not know what's going on, but they can't tell their children or the people they're with what it's about. And none of those are to do with anyone being aged 19, age 90, being male or female or being a refugee or not a refugee or living in the city somewhere or living not in the city. These are just attitudinal things. Now, actually, we know that they do tend to be linked to people's backgrounds to some degree, but I think it's quite useful to understand that a lot of the reason why people are not engaged with our culture, to call it that, is because they're not part of our world. So why do people not engage with culture? I'm using culture in a very broad way here. And I mean it from a whole range of different things. It could even be about sport, it could be about classes, it could be about theatre, it could be about film, it could be about visual arts. The same thing goes for all these different things. So we need to remember that different people have different backgrounds, different understanding and different values. There's a tendency for people to assume a typical audience member and usually that typical audience member is based on us, like what we think about ourselves, which we project outwards and not on them. So we tend to make assumptions about what they think. Linked to this, different types of the public have different ways of communicating, finding out about events, understanding whether it is for them, do we speak the same language, not just literally the same language, but do we speak the language that we all understand or do we speak in a language that's only part of our group language, our part of our group way, our little world view of speaking? Also, I mean, I think that the work that you do that we've been talking about just now is that you are very open to all sorts of different ways of presenting your work. So, for example, when we were talking about music happening in the different places, that's really nice. We A lot of the work we do find that people really like being able to experience events outside of a venue in a public space, somewhere where they feel comfortable with. But very frequently people, culture can be based around very particular conventions. And those conventions are often about what's convenient for us. 
So a classic example is in the UK, most theatre shows or concerts start at either 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the evening. And that's totally logical time, but it's based on a convention that always happens then, and it's also based on the present the the staff and the artists who are presenting it. Another famous thing is that museums until recently always didn't used to be open on a Sunday, so people very often want to go and visit places like this on a Sunday, but we're not open. So rather than it being based on what it is that, that's useful and convenient for us, we could base it on what the audiences want. So, for example, the seven thirty in the evening thing is something that often annoys me because in many parts of northern Europe the work day is work something like nine o'clock till five thirty, nine thirty to five thirty. And then people go home and have something to eat and then they go out. But if you have an event on that's at seven thirty, eight o'clock, you have a very narrow time to go home and then get out again. And when I used to work in an art centre, I found one of the things we changed was we changed the timings around a lot. And just changing the times, for example, to late night, later night, not that we can do it in the pandemic things at the moment, but later night, say 10 o'clock, was often a very convenient time for some people. Or on the other hand, for people who are at home during the day, having events during the afternoon. So I'm not saying we should, you know, change our timings or change our places as such, but just being aware of the way in which conventions, the way in which we normally expect things to happen is quite important and those are often based around conventions so another typical example is depending on your religious background so generally speaking in the christian church the religious day is sunday some parts it's saturday of course jewish church is saturday and in the muslim world it's friday so having an event on a friday afternoon is uh, by definition going to exclude many Muslims from attending, if that's something that's important to you. I know that's kind of obvious, but the amount of times I see people not taking these sorts of things into account is really staggering. And I'm not just talking about the UK, I'm talking about internationally in different places as well. I'm going to storm right on here. So just considering two different things. So we looked at why people don't engage with culture. Let's look at why people do engage with culture. And I think that it's not always what we assume in the sense that it's not always about posing you are going to a film and it's about that film itself. Of course, we focus on what that film is and why it's important. But in that very nice way in which it was described, the open air cinema, it's the overall experience of going to the open air cinema in the open air within the surroundings, a little bit social, in a place, or the different things we described, for example, with in that place. And also, for many people, it's, it's things like the overall treat, the overall kind of going somewhere in its just special occasion. And, of course, different people have different reasons, which we'll come back to in a second. So this is um, just a very simple example. This is in the UK. It's in the northeast of England. It's called the Hull Freedom Festival. It's a festival that takes place outdoors. And it's very successful at attracting a wide public. I don't know if you can see from this picture, you can see many people who are not normally engaged with culture in the sense of these people do not go into the local theatre. They do not go into the local gallery. And they're not just interested in entertainment, by the way. They are interested in often quite challenging work. This work that they're looking at here is actually about uh, modern day slavery. In fact, uh, delivered in a parkour, outdoor arts way. And I think if you described an event about modern day slavery and in a parkour style in an art centre, you wouldn't get a tenth of the people who are here. So... We know from the research we've done from this festival and ones like it that, for example, public spaces are very often where people feel comfortable. They're not in traditional venues. The events are described in simple, non-pretentious ways, which emphasise the reasons for going, the benefits for going. Also, we know that people go not just for the event as such, but for other social reasons and, for example, civic pride. So in this case, all the events are free. Uh, People appreciate the fact that they are paying their local taxes, their their local rates to the authorities. So in a sense, they feel like it's 
what is part of being in whole, this, this part of living in whole is about engaging with the local festival. It's, it's part of your civic pride that Hull produces a great festival. Very similar to the one like in Elefcina, you know, to know that that annual festival that happens every year is like regarded in a very high prestigious way that's about so being attached to that that motivation is actually being part of being there is it very important and one of the famous things that we discovered that was people said was stupid at the time but people have now recognized was actually a very clever thing which is that people said that they liked attending these sorts of events because they could leave when they wanted to now, um, that seems almost paradoxical, the idea that people attend because they know they can leave when they want to. But this was very much a thing about people felt, just like we did when we're looking at newcomers exercise now, that people thought, if you go, you're making a big dedication to go to a concert, say, and if you don't like that concert and you leave in the middle, it looks like you're making a real statement. Whereas this was something about people feeling like they could engage with the event on their own terms, a very important part of what we're looking at. And this is, um, for example, when we do research, we look at all the different reasons why people might go. The light blue color is uh, when we give people all the possibilities, so you can choose as many as you want, and the one in purple are their main reason. And it doesn't necessarily matter exactly what they say because it varies from place to place. But in this case, I think it's what we was interesting is that the second and third reasons were to spend time with friends and family and to enjoy the atmosphere. And actually all the traditional cultural things that people sometimes think are cultures about, like to learn something or to be intellectually stimulated are much further down the list. I'm not saying they're not important, but I think it's worth considering all the different reasons why people go and engage with culture. And linked to this is our next key point, which goes back to what we've been saying before, which is that the audience is not one kind of person. You've already seen this slide before. We bring it back to point to that point again, because one of the real problems that people have with audience development is thinking about people in very narrow ways. And they think about them either as a gigantic group of people who have nothing in common, or they think about only individuals. And then, but segmentation and the idea of groups is thinking about groupings of people, which is a useful way of looking at it. And particularly look at that bottom point, they are looking for different things from their engagement. That's what that previous point is about. So, you know, why do people engage with culture? It's a good question. Different people have different reasons for attending. Ideally, we need to get a sense of what those reasons are so that we can then either meet them or work with those ideas, maybe adapt them slightly. We need to be able to think about those different groupings of people. And it's not to say that people naturally in the whole world always fit into these groups, but in terms of what we're doing, where we're trying to do something efficiently and effectively, working with groupings of people that are looking for Different sorts of things is really crucial to audience development work. And in order to do that, what we need to do is know something about them. Now, normally in this part of a audience development sort of course, what we'd look at is much more precisely around the issue of audience research. We can't do that here because we just don't have the time. But what we would encourage you to think about in the time between now and the year that it takes place is to really think about are there some ways that you can research your audience? not just your audience, but the potential through survey work, through other data, through your online analytics, maybe other population data that exists. This is something which I think the ECOC team can certainly take a lead on with Galway 2020. A better example is Rieka 2020. They actually did some quite good work before the year started into the different publics of Rieka to understand whether they engaged or not, what sort of things they were interested in, what they thought about the year, all those sorts of things. Very useful. And just to help us with this, we're going to use this exercise that Niels and I do a little bit now. It's called uh, the Personas Empathy Mapping. So what we're going to do is take one of those groups and think about who they are as a real person. 
Now, this is kind of a slightly contradictory thing because what we're doing is imagining and we're imagining it's a representative of that group. But in persona mapping, what you're doing is you're thinking, you know, what's their background, age, gender, generation, family background? What do they value? What is important to them? That's in general, you know, in their lives. What sort of culture are they like? What is their relationship to you as a, as a provider of culture? What do they love or hate about us? Who influenced them? Who do they look to for influencing? How can we help them? And usually when we do this sort of exercise, we really get people to imagine it pictorially, visually as well. And that often means drawing a picture of them and giving them a name. Now, the issue is, of course, that they might become a little bit like stereotypes or cliches, but that's part of the process. What this does is help us to understand what our stereotypes are, because once we've got the personas, we can then go away and test how far they're true and to think about what's wrong with them. How do we make them more precise? So we're just going to have a quick go now with this exercise. Neil, I'll pass over to you to explain what we want people to do now. OK, thank you. I was just sitting with the breakouts because we're going to divide you into four rooms. And what we would like you to do is to, basically, you have to decide whether you, your persona is part of the digital teenagers or the activists or the temporary citizens or a refugee or a sport club lover. And when you start defining your persona, give your persona a gender. Is it a male or a female? Give the persona an age, give the persona a name. That's the first three things. And then start adding to their background. Who are they? What have they done? What kind of values have, do they have? What's important to them? What sorts of cultural events might they like? Do they go alone or do they go in company? What's their relationship to you? What do they love to do? What do they absolutely hate? The hate thing is really funny, actually. Where do they go for influence? Who are their influences? How can we help them? How can you help? What would make them go to something in Elipsina? So it's a lot of fun, but it's also fun in the way that they need to be as close to true characters. So this is where you don't say the names of your friends, <laughs> but you can borrow characteristica from people you know who are kind of in these club, in these different segments, okay? So when you go out now, you can uh, draw a map, you can draw a figure on, on a paper, you can uh, talk about one imaginary, but try to have one that kind of writes everything down, because we will ask one from each of the four groups to be the one presenting your persona. So we will end up having four personas. Mm -hmm.